All right. Hello. I am here with Les Perlman. How are you today, Les? I'm fine. How are you, Jenna? I'm good. I'm excited to have you here in person at the NCT convention. Well, I'm excited to be at the <laughs> NCT convention. <laughs> you arrived today. Yes. Good. All right. Well, we're going to jump right in. We've got a lot of questions to go through. And um, we'll start with the first one. So tell me about the journey that led you to wanting to do research into machine scoring of assessments. Okay, well, actually, that journey actually started when I entered college. I, in California, I took something that is, used to be called the Subject A exam for the University of California. It's been around for 150 years. And when I took it, it was pure error counting. The night before I took it, a friend of mine's older brother, who was a graduate student in English who graded the exams, came over and told us what to do. And he basically said, if you don't know how to spell a word, don't use it, because three misspellings in your fail. And, you, and he went on and he said, if you think you're going to have a comma splice, don't write the sentence, because a comma splice can make you fail the exam. So basically, I was writing, I wrote probably the worst essay in my life um, that was totally vapid, but it was a nice five-paragraph essay with a thesis sentence at the end of the first paragraph with three topic sentences, and I passed the exam and was able to go into regular freshman English. And it made me cynical about testing. Then in Later on, after I got my PhD, I had a postdoc at USC and started testing, doing placement testing, both at USC and then at Tulane, and then when I came to MIT. And we were giving timed impromptus too, and we were grading them holistically, better, much better. But I realized that still it was the same kinds of problems in the subject A, that I was testing essentially fluency and nothing else, how somebody could write about something that they would never thought about before um, in 25 minutes or 45 minutes, which is totally unnatural. I mean, no one ever gets a message from their boss telling them, is failure necessary for success? Get back to me in 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's exactly how these tests are run. So, in the 1990s, I started experimenting at MIT with better ways of assessment. We developed the online essay assessment that became IMO and the IMO consortium, where students would have time, they'd write it online, again, using computers, but using computers in a productive way, and tying it to reading so students would actually be doing the kind of tasks that they would be doing in actual classes that they would be taking, where they would be making arguments based on readings that they had. That they had. Mm -hmm. And it was a much, much better kind of test. And that went on. It was funded by Microsoft and MIT and a consortium. And a bunch of schools joined us. And that made me realize that assessment could be a very positive thing. Mm -hmm. um, then in 2005, I attended a meeting uh, at the Four Seas in San Francisco where they rolled out the new SAT writing test. And they gave me, and when they gave us the sample booklet, I realized that unlike all the ways that I've been trained, that there was almost a perfect correlation between length and score. Alan Casson, who trained me at USC and who was the first chief reader of the AP English exam, always told me to always put in some long bad exams in training samples and some short good exams or to work against readers' predilection to grade long exams high and short exams low. And these training samples did the exact opposite and it looked like they cor correlated completely. So I did what any good MIT nerd would do. I went to my hotel room and counted the words in all the training essays and put them in an Excel spreadsheet with the scores and got the highest correlation I ever had gotten in any kind of test data ever. It was about 0.93, which means that about 90% of the, of the predicted score could be just determined solely by the number of words. 
And so that made me cynical. It also made me start thinking about when I started hearing about computer grading or scoring. And again, most of the computer grading or scoring is done on short time decimals. And in fact, many of them, like ETS's e-rater, won't grade essays of over a thousand words. And they usually want a short period of time. And so I started experimenting and looking at data from some of the studies that they did and discovered indeed that all of these programs um, overval greatly overvalued length. And that is how they were able to claim that they could match the correlation between two readers because two readers would match at about 50%. Well, about 50% of each reader's correlation on short essays is attributable to length. So if 90% of the machine scoring is on length, it can come very close without anything else at all. Yeah. And that's sort of the smoke and mirrors of machine scoring. The second thing that I realized was that all these programs love pretentious language. Um, they actually counted the frequency of infrequently used words. So that um, caused me to develop the Babel generator with three undergraduates, two MIT undergraduates and one Harvard undergraduate, all three of whom have now graduated and are making a lot more money than I am. Um, but um, what we were amazed is how easy it was. The first time in our first attempt, in our alpha trial, we were able to fool every machine and get top scores and, uh, and basically just create total gibberish that had long sentences and long paragraphs that a six-year-old would recognize as gibberish. But the, these computers, including E-Rater that was grading it, uh, for the E-Rater that was grading it for the graduate record exam, for which it is one of the two readers, it was giving its the highest possible score, six, and you know, which is frightening. And, and one of the other machines which grades the graduate management admissions test, we were also able to fool completely and get fives and sixes all the time, top scores. So that is, you know, that's that's how I've come to where I am now. So in listening to all of these examples, one of the things that that I'm hearing is about the problem between this correlation of looking at things just like length or a specific kind of length of words or infrequent words that are being used. But what does that, how does that concern translate into what you think about writing? Okay. Well, I think it's two things. Is writing is communication. Real writing is the transfer of thoughts, information, ideas, beliefs, feelings from one mind to another mind. Okay, that's what writing is. Mm -hmm. um, writing is a relatively new technology. Speech has been around for hundreds of thousands of years, at least, or at least tens of thousands of years. Um, writing, on the other hand, is probably about 5,000 years old. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a fairly new technology, and if you look at the first pieces of writing, there, there, a lot of them are contracts. You know, I owe, you know, I owe you 50 talents for a bag of grain that I'm going to use to plant. Um, but writing is always used for a purpose and an audience. And machines take that, take that away. But I think the real takeaway from my research is that people should, in arguing against machine scoring, should just simply say it doesn't work. It's not, we don't need very sophisticated, abstract rhetorical arguments about how it's not, it's not authentic pieces of writing. The machines don't work. And that you may have answered my second or my, my next question. Um, what's the most important thing you want people to understand from your research? The machines don't yeah. work. Yeah, okay, right. that's what I thought. I just wanted to double check and see if there was anything else hiding there. Um, okay, has, but actually, yeah. um, there are related points to that that I think are very, very yeah. important, which are machines don't measure human, anything related, any construct 
that is an essential part of human communication. Hmm. Okay. And what are those? The essential parts of human communication. I the communication of thoughts and ideas. Okay. In other words, okay. Okay. if if I can if I can tell a machine utter gibberish that's meaningless, that has no meaning, and the machine thinks that that's good, then it's not measuring meaning. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And meaning is what writing is all about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the the second part about it is the results really show that students um, that students can be easily trained to game the machine by becoming bad writers, mm -hmm. and in very horrible ways because especially with things like the Common Core tests and things like this, this may cause teachers because of raises or school reputation to just give students word lists to memorize and not even give them the meanings of the words just give them the parts of speech and have them pepper them into sentences and um, the third part, third thing from that is that they'll be teaching it will be effective but they'll teaching students not only to be bad writers but that kind of writing teaches students to be stupid mm -hmm. Got it. So it's has, so it's it's the implications beyond the assessment itself that yes. are the problem. Yep. Yep. Um, has anybody responded to your work in this arena in a way that surprised you, or maybe changed the way you think in some way? Yes. Um, I've seen some attempts and some very interesting attempts, in recent ones, of people to build classroom non-evaluative computer uses of of feedback that aren't scoring but responses that don't replace teachers that supplement teachers and that are used in very limited ways in ways that computers can possibly actually work mm -hmm. and 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 do it and i think that is that that is really helps it um what to go back actually i think this goes back to something when you're asking what my background, my odyssey, mm -hmm. the other part is coming from MIT mm -hmm. because um, I was director of writing across the curriculum there. I got to teach with computer scientists, people in artificial intelligence. I've gotten to know real linguists, including Noam Chomsky. Mm -hmm. They all think this is crazy. Mm -hmm. um, none of them believe this is possible. Um, our linguistic knowledge is so, so limited right now that a computer, we don't have enough knowledge of how, of how to, how meaning is made in language, semantics, mm. to really be able to evaluate computers. And no one will be the first person to tell you that. Hmm. Hmm. Um, so it's pretty clear that you're against machine scoring of tests. Tell me what you're for. Okay, what I am for is good assessment. Um, to quote Peter Albo, fewer assessments, but better assessments. Hmm. Okay, and those assessments should be substan substantive. They should give time to measure the kinds of skills in writing that we're looking for. But more than that, and I think it's really important, and this is something I learned in my career as a writing program administrator, is they should be graded and designed by teachers. And there's a big reason for that, which is not only it's a twofer, it's more expensive, but not only will it make better grading, much better grading, than oftentimes these tests now are graded by any college graduate who has to grade 20 papers an hour for 12 to $17 an hour in what people call cyber sweatshops. Hmm. Um, instead, you know, when you have teachers grading them, I've always thought that if I didn't have these kinds of tests, like our, our assessments that we would do for placement, I'd have to create them. Because getting teachers into a room and having them spend a half a day discussing over training samples what makes a good piece of writing and what what are the problems with this paper is some of the best kinds of professional development that you can do and so you're 
you're both getting authentic grading and you're also making better teachers at the same time. Hmm. Hmm. Got it. That, well, hopefully, hopefully somebody's listening to that <laughs> or we'll get it out there. Um, how do you advocate for these things? I mean, that makes a whole lot of, it makes a whole lot of sense to me, but how do we get that word out there? How do we advocate for it? Okay. Well, I advocate a bunch of different ways. I just testify or before, uh, before the um, Massachusetts Education Commission that they shouldn't continue um, the park and MCAS tests and they ignored me. Um, you know, the day after I testified, they voted to go ahead with this very strange plan where they were going to use half the schools were going to use one and half the schools were going to use the other. Smart between park and smart balance? No, between park and the and the homegrown oh. Massachusetts test. And are they doing like an A B test? No, it's the idea is that in a few years they're going to try to make a better Massachusetts homegrown test. But it it makes no sense from profession. But again, the commissioner of of K through 12 education, who happened to have been chair of the park consortium, um, sort of pushed it through. And um, but where I've been most successful is not making reasoned arguments as much as doing things in the media, like with the Babel generator. Um, I was on Japanese national public television um, and got some feedback from that because, you know, I showed how I could game the ETS e rating. Well, in Japan, a huge number of high school graduates take the TOEFL exam, which is graded by e rating and, and I think those kinds of demonstrations, just showing people that these things don't work, is the best thing I can do. Yeah. And it's actually, I think, more important. I mean, I do write, do write scholarship. I do write that, but I think the most important thing is to get out there in the press, and I urge other people to do that, to 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 actively cultivate people to spread the word that this doesn't work, and to tell them what does work and what can make our students literate and thoughtful. Um, and and I feel like being someone who's a respected scholar. I, I mean, I think it depends on your institution, but. You, you you may have been in a position where you may have been safe to be able to make those kinds of statements in the media, but I'm thinking about if I'm a high school teacher and I've read your work and I'm aware of it and I, I agree that it's ridiculous, but I'm in a school that's becoming very test driven and, and you know, we're, we're getting close to the second half of the school year, which is all about getting doing tests. And I'm scared to be in the media because I'm afraid I could get fired. Um, what are there things that I can do that can raise people's awareness of this that don't involve making myself public in that way? Well, you can direct them to sites like the Babel Generator. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, one of the things I saw in Measurement Incorporated, one of the companies that does that develop, has a, a grading mission called Project Essay Grade. Well, in their questions and answers, they basically have admitted that students have been using the Babel generator because they say, yes, it assumes a good faith essay and it can be full. Well, it can be full because students must have been feeding in essays from the Babel generator, which is on the web. Hmm. And anybody, you know, just Google B-A-B-E-L generator mm -hmm. and, um, and put it in any of these machines. And the scary thing is it works so well. Yeah. And so that would be a good, right. And that would be a, a powerful way to be, I could imagine doing that sort of with your colleagues within your school or something like that to illustrate to the community this. Um, what if teachers wanted to show how the alternate could work? Are there places that people can go? Is there research that people can look to that cites what you were talking about earlier of the twofer? The, yes, the, well, I think the best model of that by far is the analytic writing continuum of the National Writing Project, mm -hmm. and which is national. And they do, they do, they have scoring sessions every summer with people. I've attended them, and they are exactly that kind of model. Mm -hmm. 
it was developed by Paul and Mahal, and, and it's really a perfect example of of teacher driven, authentic, very precise, and very valid grading and assessment. Okay, great. Um, this has been wonderful, and we're going to close with a question that Doug Hesse actually opened this convention with. He asked um, everybody in the audience to imagine that five years from now something has happened that has improved literacy, teaching, and learning, and what is it? Well, I'm going to have to actually say that it's going to be two things. Mm -hmm. Okay. The first thing is that teachers all of a sudden are getting more respect and pay. That, I mean, one of the things that really scares me about what's happening in America is the bifurcation of education. I taught at MIT. I did a large study of writing at Harvard. At both at MIT and Harvard, class sizes and writing classes are 12 to 15 students. Um, at Harvard, it's 12 students and a, a full-time load is two classes. So a full-time teacher has 24 students. They are expected to conference with those students at least once every other week. And that's, that is how it should be. But again, it's the elite who are getting that. It's not the people who actually really need that kind of intervention at community colleges and places like that. And if you look at the school systems in the world that work, like in Korea, Poland, and Finland, mm -hmm. teachers are very valued and they're paid what paid well. In America, the average salary of a school of a K through 12 school teacher is lower than that of a dental hygienist. Now, I don't want to. I think dental hygiene is very important, but I also think literacy is very important. Mm -hmm. And so. I think one of the things we have to do is to stop stop all these moves to try to do education on the cheap and spend money. I was, I'm a baby boy, and I was very fortunate because I was fortunate. I had two things going for me, which was one, we had a subsidy because it was the sexism subsidy. We had all these smart women teaching us because they couldn't be lawyers and doctors and all these other things because the only jobs women could get then were teachers, librarians, and nurses. Mm -hmm. And so we had lots of very smart women who now wouldn't be teachers. And the other subsidy we had was the GI Bill. We had all these very smart men who were the first generation in their family who went to college after World War II on the GI Bill, they thought public school teaching was a really good job compared to their fathers working in factories. And so I had really good teachers, and they're all gone now. Hmm. And, and, and again, you know, we, we have to come up and pay decent wages to get those women back and get those men back into the classroom. I have never thought of it that, or never heard it spelled out that way before. Is that's that, true. Yeah, no, that's so, that's so interesting that I, I mean, usually when we talk about um, women sort of having to go into nursing or teaching, it's, it's, um, it's spoken of as these were the, these were the limited choices, but I never thought that that would concentrate, it concentrated people with a whole lot of passion for their disciplines. It, it was a subsidy something. because they didn't have anywhere else to go so they could pay them cheaper because they didn't have any, very many other choices. Wow. But they would have been just as passionate about the subject and excited to be able to teach it to their students in innovative ways. Uh, absolutely. And they were very smart people. I had some very smart teachers. Do you tell me about one of them? Um, actually, well, um, I had some really great, actually one of, one of the smartest teachers I had who taught me about writing, but she was also a math teacher, and she was actually the second wife of Henry Miller. And she was just uh, quite amazing, and she, you know, she wouldn't be a teacher now. 
Um, and but then I had other, you know, I had other teachers who would would sit with me and you know go over, you know, go over draft after draft after draft because they had the time. Oftentimes these were women who decided not to get married. They had they didn't have families. Sorry, that was unpleasant. Yes. Okay. They, they didn't have families. But they, um, but you know, instead of spend now, they'll probably be spending ninety hours a week at the law firm, you know, making five hundred thousand dollars a year. Yeah. No, that's interesting. So elevating the profession would be a thing that would really change. And other countries have done it. If you look at the countries that have the best educational system. Mm -hmm. It's countries like Korea. I was on a plane with someone like from Korea, and I asked him how are teachers thought of in Korea, and he said they are like gods. And um, you know, and you know, if you in again in America, you know, we're right around dental technicians. Yeah, well, we've we've got a we've got a long road to go, but do you feel do you feel hopeful? I feel hopeful. I think it's a fight we have to keep fighting. Mm -hmm. I'm ready to fight. And um, I think it's too important not to fight because literacy, if you believe in democracy, democracy is all about literacy. It's all about people being able to evaluate arguments and to read and to think. And if if people aren't literate, our republic doesn't have a good future. So it's, it's I think, one of the most important things we can be doing. That is a beautiful way to end. Thank you, Les. Thank you. All right.